Well, Sally Costello joins us in studio, and I've interviewed him many times, probably 10 times over the phone. He's a fellow a Texan. I'm proud of that. There's so many great Texans involved in the fight against corruption in the New World Order. And I read his book about four years ago, and, I mean, you want something that's definitive proof of government-sponsored uh, drug dealing and terror against the American people, because that's what the drug war is, is a terror attack on the American people. Powder Burns, Cocaine Contras, and the Drug War is an incredibly powerful book, and uh, it's by Sally Castillo III and Dave Harmon. Sally, it is a great honor to have you here with us today, my friend. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. You bet. Uh, listen, I know you don't like to talk about yourself here. Every time I try to get you to introduce yourself, you really just kind of glaze over it. But I want you, for the radio audience and for the TV audience will be watching this in the near future, spend about five minutes. I mean, tell us, because it's important about, you know, your upbringing, your integrity, all the different positions you were in. I mean, I, mean, I really respect your amount of experience. And then being inside uh, that situation and going against all that peer pressure and really defending America more today than I think you ever did uh, in the past. So, Sally, uh, tell us about Sully Costello and, and, and uh, your life. Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I do come from a very patriotic family, uh, third generation here in the United States. Um, my father's a World War II veteran, and as the only son, uh, how, to show how patriotic we were, he instructed me to... Uh, going to the military and of course that was devastating for my mom because uh, how can you send our only son into war and I went into Vietnam and um, served my country proudly and came back went to school graduated became a police officer and uh, you know I was uh, educated very highly on um, what it took to be a patriot and um, I continued to serve my country by uh, being a police officer detective sergeant and in 1979, it was one of the very few uh, Latino agents was hired by the DEA, and of course my first assignment was New York City. And after doing four years in New York City, I was assigned to uh, to Central and South America, where I got involved in um, searching and destroying missions on uh, coca fields and uh, marijuana plantations, opium plantations, and so forth. And uh, it was an eradication program we had going up there. But let's see, uh, you're just glazing over all this. Let's right. go back to your sniper activity in Vietnam. Right. I, uh, my last couple of few months in Vietnam, I was uh, uh, was volunteered to uh, be a sniper in Vietnam. And I got on-the-job training in Vietnam. And uh, we would go out there into uh, Laos and Cambodia and uh, uh, do some sniping uh, for our... Uh, our, uh, our, our unit and basically a lot of people think that back in 1971 was almost the close of the war and it wasn't because we were very few that were left in there and we were trying to do as much as we could with what little we had. You were uh, kind of a rear guard? Uh, well, I was uh, I was an infantry sergeant you know I had my own uh, squad going out there and uh, and uh, doing all kinds of covert operations and um, became a sniper and I was trained there and um, uh, went straight into uh, doing some uh, uh, covert operations for for my unit in in Cambodia. So with that experience and also uh, your high test scores, you moved up quickly. Uh, when, uh, once you became a police officer, then you became a DEA officer and went right into, uh, as you said, search and destroy missions there. Tell us about that. Well, basically, what happened? We uh, the DEA at that time had an operation called Operation Snowcap, and it was like a paramilitary agents, uh, DEA agents, going out there training the. Uh, basically the dead squads and uh, we used those dead squads to go out there and, and, and fight the so-called uh, narco-terrorist units uh, cells that were in uh, in the jungles of South America and Central America. When did you start, and of course you've met George Bush, you've met all these people, I mean tell us specifically how high you rose in the DEA and then let's go through your awakening when you really started to see the government control of uh, the narcotics trade. Well, basically, it was uh, when we started training the dead squads, I realized that uh, there was something wrong with what we were doing, and I was in denial at the beginning. And secondly, um, I was trying to justify what they were doing. And, uh, you know, all my life I wanted to be a, a drug agent. And, uh, you know, when I left Vietnam, I, I promised myself that if I did survive that war, I would be a federal drug agent, which I did. But when I came to Central America and South America, I realized for the first time that I came into contradictions on my assignment. And basically, we turned out to be the bad guys. We were actually the guys who were getting away with murder. And we were out there training um, dead squads instead of uh, fighting the so-called war on drugs. And uh, um, it was in Salvador and Guatemala when I finally realized that uh, 
uh, the United States government was heavily involved in drug trafficking, and it was in June, January of 1986 where I met George Bush Sr. At, um, at the cocktail party at the ambassador's residence, and another Cuban uh, by the name of Piedra, uh, who was a Cuban fighter, um, you know, fighting against Cuba. And uh, at that time, they brought in a lot of Cubans uh, from the Miami area to, uh, to help set up uh, covert operations into Central America. And that's when I told George Bush myself that, you know, he came up to me and asked me what was my assignment in Central America. And I basically told him that I was the one that was um, covering El Salvador and uh, that we had received a lot of reliable information that the Contras themselves were heavily involved in drug trafficking at El Opango Airport. Uh, and I named, mentioned I met Felix Rodriguez and Oliver North and so forth. He just smiled, shook my hand, and walked away from me. So I knew then and there that my government was complicit in, in drug trafficking. So, I mean, it's your chance. You're uh, getting to talk to, I guess, Vice President at that time. Yes, he was Vice President at that time. So, I mean, here you are, uh, this high-level DEA officer, the uh, head of those operations, uh, interfacing with the military for Latin America, and you've got this chance to talk to George uh, Bush uh, senior and, and right out of the gates. You bring this up to him and he uh, he just smiles and walks off. Exactly. That that confirmed to me that my government was involved in, in these atrocities and the second confirmation was that later that afternoon uh, he met with George Bush and uh, Negro Ponte and the other guys uh, that came in from the surrounding areas and they met at the uh, third floor of the uh, U.S. Embassy that's known as the bubble and they were discussing the Iran-Contra um, uh, operations and drug smuggling and so forth. And the reason I know that because there was a colonel, U.S. colonel by the name of George Hooker, who told me uh, exactly what the meeting was all about. So, uh, tell us what year that was, because then you began to learn more and more. Things started to accelerate. Yeah, it was eighty. Uh, I got into Central America and South America in '84, and uh, in '86 I met Bush. In '87 I was still running uh, operations uh, up to 1991. I was there for close to five years, a little bit more than five years, and um, I saw all the atrocities, all the training. Uh, we brought in the mercenaries, uh, for example, we brought, brought in mercenaries from uh, Venezuela. They all worked for the contract uh, labor for the CIA, and they were the ones that were killing a lot of the people and getting involved in, in you know, setting up uh, uh, spin operations and killing people and blaming on the guerrillas and so forth. Now, it's an old problem, reaction, solution. Where yeah, ex you exactly. You do something bad, then blame it on somebody. And that's right. And one of the incidents was in 1989 when there, the Jesuit priests uh, were murdered, uh, three of them and, and three of the ladies, the nuns, and a couple of kids. And uh, uh, they went in there and they massacred those people. And then they turned around and blamed it on the FAMLN, the, uh, the um, guerrilla group. And the only reason it was exposed that there was an ad American advisor with them uh, in the group um, that couldn't live with with himself and came into the United States and told the whole story and uh, and broke the story on who actually did the murders. And uh, I was myself um, part of the plan at the, uh, who would meet at the Sheraton Hotel, the Sheraton Hotel and, and one of the uh, captains that was involved in the murders uh, set up the whole uh, blueprint of how they were going to do it. Really? So, so when did you learn of that? Well, I learned it uh, because when I went, I went to Salvador, I would always meet with them because they were supposed to be our counterparts uh, from the Atlacat, uh, the Special Forces uh, Salvadorian. Um, they were very well known to, to go out there and kill a lot of people. And it was a special unit that was trained by uh, our Special Forces from Delta Force to uh, uh, the A-Team that went in there, and, and they trained those people on how to go out there and, and kill counterintelligence units and so forth. And to be clear, because I've studied this, obviously I didn't live it like you have, but I've interviewed a lot of other folks who were there, and, and they've mirrored what you're saying, just from different perspectives and angles, that most of the time it wasn't even really even killing their so-called enemies. They would a lot of times just go kill innocent people, kill little kids, and go, oh, look, the terrorists did this. Exactly, especially uh, every time they, uh, the funding came up uh, with Congress to try to, uh, to fund the, uh, the, the so-called covert war and, you know, or the Contra war, uh, they would set up uh, some kind of big uh, operation where people, innocent people, get killed and blame it on the guerrillas. Did you ever talk to these guys and go, how do you kill, say, <coughs> how do you slit a little five-year-old boy's throat? You know, uh, I did that. Believe it or not, I asked an agent, CIA agent by the name of Randy Capster. He says, how can you guys, you know, do this and get away? He says, look, we own these third world countries. We elect the presidents. 
And no, but I mean, uh, it's like Project Gladio. They admit, and it's an Army field training manuals, kill kids. That really will make the people get mad. How do you go blow up a school bus of little kids? How do you take a little five-year-old and slit their throat as they're jerking in your arms? And and their thing was business as usual in Central and South America. That's it's just killing doing. little kids. We've been it's doing business like this for many, many years, and nobody will ever stop us. But I'm talking about their souls. Oh, I, their souls, it's, it's uh, their... Uh, they're gone beyond the point of return. Uh, you can see it in their eyes. You know, we had one guy that was in there for uh, 10 years uh, at uh, Guardia Hacienda uh, Billy, who that's all he did, ran counterintelligence and went out there on covert operation and killed a whole bunch of innocent people. You know, that makes me angry. It doesn't even make me scared. You know, they've got armies of these bloodthirsty killers and now one of their captains is running uh, most of our government, it, it, it makes me get so angry to know that they've set up this system, that they're so arrogant, they think they're always going to get away with it. I want to fast forward. You told me a year and a half ago on this broadcast, and, and, the, and the transcripts are up there, the audio is up there, you said they're hiring Latin American death squads, the commanders or the, the uh, low-level men from 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and they're making them captains and sending them to Iraq. And I thought, well, Sally always tells the truth. That must be true, but I didn't have any documentation. Now it's been in Latin American papers six months later, and then now in the last five months, it's been in U.S. and British papers that thousands of, quote, uh, great anti communist fighters of the 70s and 80s are all going to Iraq and then it turns out they're the ones in there raping these little kids in front of their parents then John Yu in a debate with uh, Professor Castle up in Chicago and we had the professor on we even have the audio of it uh, he says you wrote in memos White House memos that, that you can order the torture of children in front of their parents and John you said yes we can do that now they're admitting they torture children I mean what uh, can well I you know the sad thing about it when um Negro Ponte was the ambassador in Honduras and in El Salvador. And as you know right now, Salvador is the only Latin American country that's got troops in Iraq. Now, the guy who was in charge of the death squad in El Salvador was a U.S. colonel named James Steele. He was an officer's officer. He's the one that set up the whole um, Operation Phoenix Blueprints into Salvador. And now Colonel Steele is in Iraq running the commandos with the Salvadorian military that's up there now. So they, it's the same blueprint they used in Vietnam. They brought it into Guatemala, El Salvador, and it worked perfectly. Now they're taking it into Iraq, where they're going to implement the same tactics that they used in Guatemala, and they, it's commandos going out there killing people. But uh, what has changed, though? Because back in the 70s and 80s, they would deny all this. Now John Yu, who's the counterpart of Alberto Gonzalez, who also wrote memos similar to this, saying Bush is above the law. But you went further than Gonzalez. He said we can commit genocide. This is in the memo. And this is public. This is in the newspaper. We covered it last week. They, they said we can, quote, torture small children in front of their parents and crush their, I don't want to say it, uh, their genitalia in front of them. I, I mean, they should all be arrested right now. I mean, uh, what does that say about them that they're now announcing it openly? Well, it's, um, they're admitting that uh, what happened uh, 10 years ago. And the sad thing about it that uh, I remember when uh, Bush uh, Jr. came into uh, in being president, he denied the National Archives to release the documents uh, at the time period that Reagan and Bush were involved in Central America. And the reason they're being sealed right now is because he won't release them, even though Congress has passed a law that says you've got to release all documents after 10 years. And he will not release them because it's going to implicate uh, his father and, and, and Reagan in, involving in drug trafficking and all these atrocities. Well, I want to personalize this. When they would kill little kids in the different villages, and then leave their bodies laying out saying that uh, other people done it. Now, again, the documents are out, the witnesses are there. It was, it's admitted that it was the death squads doing it. Uh, I mean, what would they specifically ha I mean, I know they'd shoot them, they'd stab them. I mean, would they do the stuff that John Hughes is talking about? Would they torture the kids in front of the parents? Uh, exactly. And, and you know, it, it's so familiar because I see it today on the, on the drug war where agents will go up there and, and they can't find anything on the main guy, so they use the wife or the kids uh, to arrest them and, and try to uh, get the, the father to, to commit uh, that he was involved in drug trafficking. Oh, it's said in Iraq that they're kidnapping whole villages of, of, of women and children and they make the men come in and admit they're terrorists. Exactly. And, and they're using the, the family uh, to, to get back to, uh, to the sympathizers, I guess. Uh, that's the, pure uh, mafia terrorism. Oh, that's, that's, that's organized, that's racketeering, organized crime. I mean, you can tell these people has conspired to to genocide uh, 
a uh, whole group of people up there. I want to get more into the drug dealing, more into your amazing book, uh, Powder Burns, Cocaine Congress and the Drug War, a must-have. But, but to the police officers listening right now, to the, to the CIA people, because I, I mean, they call me, I get emails, most of them are on our side now. Uh, to everybody out there listening, what do you want to say to them about what they've got to do to stop this? Because it's clear that they're meaning to do all this here in America. And you said that a year and a half ago on this show, and now I have the Houston Chronicle uh, where they're reporting that Halliburton's going to run camps in America. Exactly, and uh, that's that's they're getting away with it. The martial law will probably kick in within a few years or so, but they're going to be you know police officers. You're going to realize that um, violating civil rights uh, uh, under the Fourth Amendment and search and seizure, where you can stop a vehicle and if the guy doesn't give you permission to search a the vehicle, then you call the canines to come and do your job. Uh, that's that's illegal. That's profiling, and, and you know you can't be doing that. What's going to happen? Most citizens now are going to file civil civil suits against police departments. They're going to lose a lot of money, and, and a lot of police officers think that they can get away. Well, they're going to sue the department. No, they will sue you individually, and they will take your retirement. They will take uh, whatever you have, um, monetary values, and and the courts were going to rule. And the president of the United States at one time said, you know. Racial profile is illegal in this country. So well, more than even just racial profiling, you, you, you mentioned martial law. I mean, let's say the, the same group of criminals sets off an A-bomb in a city and then says, we got to have martial law to keep you safe. When we get back, I mean, I want to uh, hear you specifically give the police your take on what they should do when they're asked to do unconstitutional things, criminal things like they ask you to do. And you said no. Sally Costello is our guest. we got so much to talk about with him today. There's a lot of new information he's posted on his website today, a lot of new stuff that he hasn't really talked about in the past that he's now going to go public with. So this is going to be some groundbreaking info. You'll want to stay with us. All right, my friends, we're here back live with our guest, Sally Castillo. He's been with us for the entire broadcast uh, today, now another two hours. Even in the third hour, we have a guest coming on who broke the big news uh, over on national television yesterday from inside the government about uh, Bush and, of course, Blair thinking of ways to provocateur Saddam into doing something so they could invade. And then Bush also in the memos snickers and laughs and talks about how they can just have uh, some of their quote defectors lie and say that they found WMDs. I mean just just right there lying again. And Now, uh, Sally, you've been uh, studying this for a long, long time. Uh, it just seems like the, the, the same crew has gotten away with so much stuff all over the world that now they think they can get away with it here. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, you've talked a lot about that in the past. Can you, can you speak to that now? Yeah, basically it's the same crew. If you look at Elliot Abrams, Negro Ponte, um, Oliver North, all those people are the same people that are still working at the White House. Abrams is a, I in charge of the Middle East now. And, you know, he was convicted. Um, so was Oliver North, uh, convicted felon and so forth. But the same crew, and I call them the same terrorist cell that was back in the 80s, or, uh, they were in Vietnam, remember that, going back to Vietnam where Felix Rodriguez and Oliver North were, and um, they came into Central America, and from Central America now they're in Iraq, and they're c continuing to, uh, to, do, uh, to conduct these atrocities. But George Bush is a good Christian man, and Oliver North, we've had him on this show, he's so friendly and nice, he, they're not involved in anything bad, let's, let's specifically get into government uh, drug trafficking. Explain to us how the drug war really works and who really controls drugs. Because people say, well, if they're shipping it in, then why do they put my kid in jail it, when he gets caught with some cocaine? Explain how that works to people. Well, basically, uh, a lot of people would think, well, they're making money for covert operations. But the bottom line is they were lining their own pockets. And when I say their own pockets, I'm talking about Felix Rodriguez, Oliver North, uh, Bush Sr. and so forth. And the reason why is, for example, when uh, Oliver North sold th those missiles to Iran, uh, that large, for three, three times the amount of the money that were value, he kept that money and put it in his bank account. He put it under his wife's name, Pepsi, uh, Betsy uh, North. And we found 10 million in his bank account. And uh, we took that from him. And uh, of course, when he ran for U.S. Senate back in 94, uh, he had uh, 36 billion. He had money to run for president. Where did he get all that money? And of course, we know I documented uh, Ilopango Airport, Hangars 4 and 5, that was owned and operated by the CIA. We took pictures of the loads coming in of cocaine. Uh, 
arms coming in and going and, and so forth. By the way, we have those photos. We're going to be putting those uh, in this TV report. Exactly. And, you know, uh, we have mammals where uh, North uh, is uh, set in the D.C. Uh, uh, three to um, to uh, Honduras to pick up cocaine paste or, or to South America and bring it back. Well, you know, from the other end of this, we've had Terry Reed up at uh, Mina in Arkansas, the CIA officer, just there to train pilots, and he's there watching them unload cocaine, and he mentions all the same names. Exactly. It's just Bill Clinton also involved. Exactly. Well, you know, there's an old saying that people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw rocks because it was uh, Clinton was a uh, governor at the time. And uh, when this covert operation was being run out of uh, out of Salvador into uh, into Mena, Arkansas, so you know there is a uh, there's evidence to show. And uh, but some people say, but wait, I saw him do a drug bust. Those are the little cartels that aren't paying their cut. Exactly, they're not paying their tax on, uh, or getting their permission. And, and Can you explain how that works? Well, basically, there's there's uh, one major monster head that that runs the whole operation. Uh, they're the ones that. Uh, are in contact with the major uh, uh, cartels in Colombia, and uh, it was the Medellin and the Cali cartel at the time. And uh, basically, they're um, when they didn't want to play ball ball with the United States, they took them out. And one great example is Noriega. Noriega had been a CIA asset for many years. Stay there. We've got to start the uh, second hour. We'll get right into how this thing really works when we return. All right, my friends. We've now started the second hour of this worldwide broadcast as we blast down the AM and FM dial from Southern California to Chicago, Illinois, from Austin, Texas to Pensacola, Florida, from Kansas City, Missouri to Niagara Falls, New York. Thank you so much for joining us, simulcasting on Global Shortwave, WWCR, and of course the internet at InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. The book Powder Burns by Sully Castillo III, Cocaine Contras and the Drug War. We'll reintroduce our guest coming up in for the next segment, highly decorated Marine Corps, uh, excuse me, uh, Army veteran. It's Colonel Craig Roberts, who was the Marine Corps sniper, highly decorated. And then, of course, uh, police officer, police detective, DEA in Latin America, New York, saw the government's control, that is elements of the government's control of the narcotics trade. And we're getting into this right now, how this works, how, how when they go bust somebody, and I've talked to people that have run the spray planes, and I've had family that have lived in these areas back during the 70s and 80s. And, uh, you know, they totally concur with what Sally talks about. But today, uh, with the FARC, uh, the so-called communist guerrillas in Colombia, they have GPS on the planes. They'll spray one field, but don't touch this field. And, and they go in and only hit the people that aren't part of their drug cartel's uh, system. Uh, so, so literally, the war on drugs is the war on the CIA and the banks around it, uh, their business. Sully, is that accurate? Absolutely. I've always said that... Can you specifically talk to that? Absolutely. You know, when they... Uh, basically, what it is, is that if we were to stop drug trafficking tomorrow, our banking systems would collapse. That's how much the United States government depends on drug money. And it comes from the U.S., uh, uh, comes in from Mexico, from... South America and so forth, and uh, people that do not uh, play ball with the United States on the drug trafficking. And, and I was giving you an example earlier on Noriega. You know, Noriega had dealt m laundered money for the cartels for many years, and when he refused to train the Contras in in Panama, then George Bush Senior took him out, and uh, he's now the only prisoner of war in the United States, and uh, they will not, he, they won't release him. But that's what happens to people that that, that go against our government in third world countries. Well, they, they were getting angry at him. He was buying palaces in Switzerland bigger than theirs. Exactly. You know, there was plenty of money to go around, and they knew that. And uh, they were so scared that uh, he knew where all the skeletons were buried uh, in the United States government. And uh, that's why they, they picked him up and locked him up and uh, won't release him. And he doesn't even get a trial. It's, it, 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 it's just he's gone. He, you know, he, he just don't discuss him. Exactly. You know, and, uh, you know, they, I think they tried to release him a couple of years ago, and, and Bush Sr. said, no, don't release him because I'm scared for my life. Well, it's the same thing here in the United States. I talked to a lot of police detectives here on air, and they talk about how every time they get up into money laundering or drug dealing, it's just there's certain drug dealers, they're told, leave them alone. Exactly. Uh, in the Valley, you know, uh, we got more banks than we do Circle Ks or 7-Elevens. We got more uh, car dealerships. They started out uh, involving drug trafficking, and, and now they're monstrous in, in, in the dealerships, and, and the U.S. government will not touch them. Later, I want to talk about Los Zetas and these other groups, uh, which, again, everything you've said on this broadcast, Sally, has, has turned out to then be in the mainstream news. Uh, Los Zetas, rocket attacks, blowing up cars, killing people in Texas, police, 
And the media keeps it on the lowdown, though. It, it's like something you're not supposed to hear about because, really, these guys are the muscle uh, for uh, the uh, boys in the White House, aren't they? Well, exactly. And, and they've got a blueprint going right now where the United States government is going to annex Mexico because of the oil supplies down in Chiapas. And a lot of people laugh at me when I say that. But that's what they're doing. They're using the chaos in Laredo, uh, Nuevo Laredo, with all the killings and everything. And when they come in, they're going to use drug trafficking and corruption to take over over the uh, the land in Mexico. You know, I want to go over this slowly when we get back, Shelley. I want to explain how this works because when I see big White House uh, controlled foundations funding the La Reconquistas and others, what they don't get is that's just the spin they're going to use. Oh yeah, Mexico's merging with America. No, that's, and, and then there'll be this hype, you know, this, oh yeah, look, you know, when in reality it's U.S. corporations are just going to run Mexico and they're going to merge it. Exactly, and that's that's basically what's going to happen now. Yeah, and then the spin's going to be, it's a La Reconquista, when it's the complete opposite. Uh, we'll be right back, stay with us. But I want to now move to just Texas to give people a view of what's happening, Sally. If you can go through... You know, we uh, uh, hear the so-called Mexican radio here in Texas praising, ah ha ha, it's so funny, the Los Zetas, it's a La Reconquista, uh, you know, the Chicanos are taking over Texas, the Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, treaty is going to be uh, thrown down. But then I went and looked, it's all big neocon money, and I, didn't, I wasn't even uh, aware of the fact that you knew this during the break, you were more aware of it than I was. We're actually funding to stir all this up. Then the CFR comes out and says, we're going to merge Latin America with the U.S. And then they're telling uh, the people in Mexico, oh, no, you're taking America over, when, re when in reality, Manhattan and D.C. are taking Mexico uh, over, and they're using Los Zetas military teams trained at Fort Benning and other places <coughs> to go out and enforce and, and go out and kill the other drug dealers that aren't paying their cut into the U.S. government-controlled dominant cartels. Now, uh, uh, Shelley, you talked about this a year plus ago on this broadcast. Now, pieces of that have come out in the mainstream news, just like pieces of you talking about how they're hiring by the thousands death squad uh, soldiers from uh, Iran-Contra for Iraq. That, that had been in no newspapers. Now it's in American newspapers. So can you go through what's really happening in Texas for us? Well, basically Texas is going to be the, the front line of the, of the so-called war on drugs. And basically the, uh, the United States has controlled Mexico already for many, many years. And uh, one of the issues, for example, is uh, 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 propaganda. And, and the way they're doing it is uh, there's a guy like, for example, uh, named Luis de la Garza, who runs a big radio station in in uh, in Dallas. He used to do he used to do the Spanish programs for the Texas Rangers when Bush was was president of the Texas Rangers, and basically he has now brought in all the money from Mexico um, to go out on the Southwest and buy all the radio stations, uh, so they can use that as propaganda for the Latino votes uh, that's coming up for the next election. And, and that's how they're doing it. They're they're buying little bits and pieces. Uh, they're they're using uh, a whole bunch of stuff just to bring in from Mexico, like the setters. They're being trained uh, in the U.S., not in Mexico. The setters are being trained in in in, in ranches in South Texas. And uh, and uh, to to justify my my allegations, you got the uh, Caiviles, the special forces units in Guatemala that I trained, are now being trained. Uh, training the setters up here in, in South Texas. So we got all those people that used to work for the United States government and those third world countries are now, they're bringing in those special forces guys in to, to fight with the setters. And so they, they're they going to use a widening drug war in the Southwest as the cover for covert operations. Exactly, and then they're going to use that as an example or as a spin to try to take over Mexico because, you know, you've got Mexico that's got the the, the minerals and the gas and the oil down in down in and now we're us. hearing Halliburton's going to have to build FEMA centers for the drug war for the illegals and for bad American citizens all over Texas. Uh, oh, so, and you said that on the show. You said everything Negroponte did with death camps, all of it. They're going to do it here and sell it. It's happening. Exactly, it's happening, and you can see uh, uh, the way that. Uh, that the government is reacting, they're reacting to the same spin they did uh, back in the 80s and the 90s, and, and they're doing it again. So spell this out for us, because we've talked privately on the phone, and we've done interviews a year ago, so I'm not putting words in your mouth, I want you to specifically go over it. Uh, I mean, if this is correct, uh, 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 you know, tell me so, if not, uh, correct me, and then, and then state it uh, for us, uh, just so we get it in, in your words. 
They're masters at creating crises. They go hire using former death squad commanders and then people trained by our military, uh, yourself. They take them into Texas and other areas. They train them. They then go out and start killing all the other drug dealers or police or others that won't play ball. They rocket attack the U.S. mission in, in Nuevo Laredo. Uh, the, the State Department says it's more dangerous down there than the West Bank of Israel. Travel advisories, they let this breed and breed and breed and breed and breed. <coughs> and get worse and worse and worse and worse and then once it gets to this point then they start bringing in more of a type of martial law type scenario uh, into this entire uh, region and, and really the whole thing is their smoke screen to knock out their competition. Exactly. What, what's going on now, They remember for many many years uh, there's, a, there's been a, um, a drug trafficking but we've never seen it to the extent it's happening in Laredo where people are getting killed left and right, innocent people are getting killed left and right so they, they are building the chaos, and they're going to use, once it gets so big, they're going to bring the troops in to the borders. Uh, they're going to use all federal agencies from uh, park, uh, uh, wildlife, and so forth to, to, to um, start buying them night vision equipment and uh, building up militias uh, to go into the borders and start, uh, uh, you know, killing people so they can say that it's the setas and it's the... Uh, the drug traffickers are now, they got a $30,000 uh, bounty on any Border Patrol guy they killed and so forth. So, you know, they're building up this whole thing to, as an excuse to come in and take over Mexico. Just like they put Saddam into power and built all that up, just like they put uh, Bin Laden into power and built that up, just like they, they create the enemies and then knock them down. And then meanwhile, all these people out here running around waving Mexican flags going La Reconquista, and then I go look at where that funding's coming from. It's coming out of the White House and the big foundations to get us all fighting with each other. How do we circumvent that and, and communicate with the public, uh, you know, to all Americans and people in this country that this is being manipulated? Well, it's uh, education, you know, and you got to educate the public. You got to get more radio stations to go out there and, and talk about uh, about what really is going on in, in this country. Because if you don't, if you bury your head in the sand, that's not going to help nobody, you know. And I've always said, you know, it's kind of late to save ourselves and maybe save our kids, but it's not too late to save our grandkids because those are the ones that are going to be standing there uh, trying to find a way to uh, to survive. You know, I agree with you. I th I, the system's going to crash. It's going to get worse and worse. It always has happened throughout history, but we can lessen how bad the crash is going to be and how long it's going to go for. And, and so we need people to know who the real criminals are so as things get worse and worse and everything we say comes true, as everything we said in the past has come true, uh, not because we're geniuses, folks. We just know what's going on. Uh, people will then at least realize who is truly to blame because these globalists are also masters at doing really bad things and then again blaming it on somebody else exactly and, and once you do that then you know people say okay they were the real guys they were the bad guys so when in fact uh, both said we're the ones that get away with murder we go out there and we just genocide any country that uh, we want and uh, we did it with Iran uh, when uh, we gave uh, Hussein the uh, chemicals to uh, to gas uh, Iran uh, because he was working for us at that time period. Every major terrorist has been trained by the United States government. And then it's admitted that there were CIA advisors. The reason there's film footage of all those people that were nerve gassed by the Iranians and by the Iraqis in those gas wars is because the CIA admittedly was there videotaping it. They trained the pilots how to spray. Well, yeah, they, they do that a lot because I remember the uh, operation we had in, in, in Guatemala. Uh, Randy Capster filmed the whole uh, uh, murders of the deaths, the rapes, the torturing of the girls in, in Guatemala. And uh, they've always, uh, I remember where they, at one time, they brought in all Latin America uh, and European um, uh, intelligence officers into Guatemala uh, to train a new tactics on how to torture people. And they videotaped the whole thing. They even brought in a couple of human specimens to, to show how, how long they last uh, being tortured different ways. And all that was filmed by, by Randy. And by the way, 10 years ago they deny this. Now it's just admitted and they go, yeah, we're torturing people and we're torturing our kids in front of them. We got training manuals and, and yeah, we, and, and then we even had special forces commanders on who admitted that, well now it's admitted that Fort Benning, Georgia that they uh, train how to torture up there. Ex school of the Americas has been going on for many, many years, and we've been trying to protest this, this school every year, every November we go out there. And um, I was going to cross the line this year, but uh, I had a lot of people telling me that... Uh, well, they're putting people in jail with felonies for that now. Yeah, they, you know, you do six months to a year in jail uh, if you cross that line. But uh, people were telling me, you know, 
we need you better out here to educate the, the students and the public instead of being locked up for another year. So yeah, don't let them get you in jail. They'd yeah, probably kill you in there. Uh, absolutely, that's probably what's going to happen to me. But uh, you know, I took an oath a long time ago to protect the Constitution of the United States and the citizens. And if you know, as far as I'm concerned, I've been on bar time since Vietnam. Stay there. Let's talk about that. I mean, because uh, you've got a lot of honor, Sally. We're going to open the phones up in the next segment. Steve, Paul, Elias, many others that are holding specifically on government narcotics trafficking, government sponsored terrorism, the criminal cabal running our government, because it, it's all interconnected, but I'd like it to be you know, on that uh, general topic. 1-800-259-9231, 800-259-9231, your calls are coming up. Shelly, uh, before we went into that last break, you were talking about being on borrowed time and talking to Colonel Craig Roberts, who was a sniper in Vietnam, uh, just like you were, said that his uh, Baptist grandpa, who was a, uh, a preacher, said, son, Believe me, you know, God's going to take you home when he means to. So if you're not meant to die, you're not going to. And we're all on borrowed time, so you don't worry about dying, basically. And uh, you know, that's the point of view I've taken. I mean, th we got scumbag criminals running things. I'm going to live on my feet. I'm not going to cower to bullies. Plus, when you cower to bullies, you always get abused even more than when you stand up and at least give them a fight. You may not even win every time or ever, but they're going to move on if they know. It's like the old don't tread on me flag. You know, don't step on me, I'm going to bite you. And, and, and you know what, you may beat me in the end, but you know what, you're not going to come out of this uh, easy. And that's absolutely right. Every whistleblower knows that you speak to will tell you that it's gotten worse for them than, uh, than before they blew the whistle on the government. And it will continue to get worse on everybody that blows the whistle. But, you know, you make your peace with God. And you come out, and uh, you know you know probably what the end's going to be, but you continue to fight because somebody's got to carry that flag. You know somebody's got to push forward and go out there and and, and uh, educate the people of who these people really are. We wouldn't have any freedom if it wasn't for all those people before us that stood up and fought against corruption. And you know it took a handful to start a revolution in this country, and basically we we are a handful right now of uh, patriots that really uh, love their country and will are willing to die for our country. Do you think the globalists, you know, the, uh, these uh, global crime syndicates that are operating these crime families, it seems like they've gotten so wild now, like they think they're invincible and that they can never get caught because they're getting more and more sloppy. They're getting, because everything they're doing is being revealed. It, it's it's uh, their attitude. They're, they're, they really don't care what anybody thinks. Uh, and that's amazing and to go out there and stamp on the Constitution and, and uh, and do whatever they want to do and, and get away with it. And Randy Capster once told me, he says, look, we've been doing this for years. Nobody's ever going to stop the CIA from doing what they want to do. And he's absolutely right. Uh, you know, we, we try to educate people and people are in denial. They don't want to know the, the truth and because they're, they're scared. And that's what happened in Germany. That's how Hitler came to power because a lot of people just didn't, were in denial. You know, Americans weren't known in the past for being scared. We were known for really being willing to get in a fight and stand up against bullies. I guess we've just had it so good since the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, the cheeseburgers, the beer, the ball game. But um, it's just so sad to know these criminals can murder and kill whoever they want and do whatever they want. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, that's what the people need to wake up now. They need to wake up and, you know, take their head out of the sand and uh, uh, get involved. You know, do something, because like I said earlier, uh, it's going to be kind of late to save our kids, but hopefully we're 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 enough to to save our grandkids. Well, Luis Posada, uh, another example, of government sponsored terror. It's admitted. Uh, it's it's publicly admitted, even in the Miami papers, that he carried out bombings of airplanes with passengers on board to blame it on the Cubans. Again, that same story, and he's right here, right now in the U.S. Exactly. Luis Posada, I worked with him in, in Salvador and uh, when we were training the death squads down in Guatemala. And uh, Felix Rodriguez uh, helped him escape from uh, the jail in Venezuela and he brought him to Ilopango Airport where Posada was in charge of uh, paying the country pilots uh, all their monies. And, uh, you know, we got um, a documented uh, FBI, CIA files, guys working for the U.S. government, getting paid by the U.S. government to be a terrorist in Central America. And, uh, you know, th and the reason they continue to do this and they're arrogant at what they do is because at the end of the day, they know that the president is going to pardon him just like they pardoned Francisco Ball. What was he like? What was he like, uh, this Posada character, when you knew him? This Posada character was cold-hearted. You know, you could see it in his eyes. He had a lot of hatred in him. 
He hated the communist. Uh, he hated any Cuban that did not support their cause, and they would actually go out and kill a whole bunch of people because they did bring in a lot of Cuban exiles to fight the uh, Central American War. Now, he's about to get in a lot of trouble, though, for, for uh, uh, going out and trying and succeeding to blow up passenger planes. Tell us about that. Well, basically, he blew up uh, a passenger where uh, a Olympic team, uh, fencing team, was killed. Uh, 76 of them, if I'm not mistaken. And he blew up a couple of hotels uh, under the CIA in Cuba. So, you know... Um, now, by the way, this is all admitted, and why did he do it? Again, who you did know, he... He was working for the CIA. Uh, director at that time was George Bush Sr. And uh, he came back uh, into this country in a false passport, but he came in because he was telling the Bush family that he knew where the skeletons were and he needed to be saved from the assassinations that uh, he was... Well, when we come back, I want to take some calls, but I want to ask why they've now, <coughs> why now they finally grabbed him, and uh, now they're uh, talking about prosecuting him for blowing up the plane. Sally Costello is our guest. We're about to go straight to your calls here in just a moment. Uh, Sally, we uh, ran into that uh, last break, and we we're still talking about this uh, Luis Posada. I mean, it has been in major Miami papers, major Florida papers, what we already knew about. That, that this guy went and blew up airplanes with people on board, with Olympic teams on them. Uh, but, but now tell the audience why he did that. Well, he did it. was to, to try to blame Cuba. Uh, I apologize. I didn't have your mic on. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, they, they did try to blame uh, Cuba on it so uh, we could use an excuse to go in there and, and try to get him. You know, there's a history of how the Cuban exiles have tried to uh, blame uh, Castro uh, for a lot of things. You see it now with Venezuela, with Hugo Chavez. They're trying to do the same thing with him in Peru, the same thing with the um, uh, with, uh, with the president up there. And, uh, you know, we got uh, people like Jorge Ramos from Univision who, uh, who tries to uh, ambush uh, uh, those people every time he tries to interview them. And, you know, we call them busanos, uh, maggots that work for the, uh, for the U.S. government that, that they go out there and try to put a spin on everything that, that our government does. So if somebody hates the Cuban government so much, which I don't like the Cuban government, I mean I'm free market, I don't like Fidel Castro, you hate them so much that you'll go blow up a plane with a bunch of people, and this is all admitted now, uh, just to blame it on them. I mean that's insane. Exactly, and that's why uh, he, the, everything that they do is approved by the uh, U.S. government. It's approved by the CIA and all the way up to the White House. So You've got a copy right here of Operation Northwoods that called back in 62 for blowing up planes and blaming it on Fidel Castro. Exactly. It's blueprints that we have that, uh, that, that shows the consistency of history of uh, how we uh, go out there and we uh, destroy innocent people or, or material things and then uh, blame it on, on, our, on our enemy. Shelly, 9-11, do you believe 19 guys in a cave could have NORAD stand down and tell public officials not to fly and uh, have uh, all these hundreds of things happen and then we learn that the so-called hijackers were really trained at U.S. military bases and were really government agents? That's all admitted, but I guess that's all just a coincidence, right? Yeah, it's a coincidence. And, you know, it's people that, uh, you know, when there's something uh, going wrong with our government, uh, we have to have a disaster so we can get people's mind out of... Uh, what's really wrong and, and, and try to blame it on somebody else. There's a big Republican memo that's gone out uh, to the Republican Party leadership and it's been in the, in the D.C. news and it said we need another terrorist attack or our entire program is going to fall apart. Exactly and, and it goes back to the uh, mentality of our government now. They're, they're so wild. They're, 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 they're gun uh, rugged on, on us and they're doing everything. Um, they don't care about anybody or who gets hurt or what. and. You know they use this operations to try to, um, and you know it's going to be another another classic 9/11 uh, that you know that's going to happen next within the next six months. Uh, every time you get on this show, what you say turns out coming true. I, I hope you're wrong, Sally, but a lot of people are saying what you're saying that elements of the government are going to stage an even bigger attack to try to put the kibosh on uh, all the things that are happening where they're being exposed. Exactly. So you know it's it's going to happen, and I think. Uh, a good place would be a Ivy League university where it's going to hurt a lot of the young kids and get the generation to hate and join forces with our government to fight against uh, uh, our enemy. Oh, Sally, don't give them ideas. <laughs> well, you know, and, and that's where it's going to hit the uh, the businessman, uh, a whole bunch of uh, people that are, are educated, you know, and uh, they have to use it because we have now 
Most of the students are waking up. They've been putting out reports. The globalists have been putting out public reports going, we've lost the young people. They now know about us. Well, and now, right now, at the University of Texas at Penn American in Edinburgh, they got the CIA now in campus lecturing on foreign policy. No, I, you want to go to UT or Texas A&M. They, they, they have been totally taken over, but it's backfiring. Nobody's buying it. Exactly. Every time the CIA comes to campus at the university up there, I grab 300 people to go out there and we protest and we show them pictures of all the atrocities they did and the CIA guys can't believe that I'm out there with a sign and and with my uh, Vietnam shirt on and telling them that this is what the CIA really does. And a lot of students weren't aware of what, what it was. They know that getting a job with the government has got good benefits and good retirement, you know, the whole nine yards. No, you're being recruited into the mafia. Oh, exactly, and that's what you're doing. And and they got they need fall guys. Remember that they need fall guys. To, when something goes wrong, they're going to blame it on well, somebody else. Well, they have this new movie out, Syriana, and it's 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 written and, and based on the true life of that uh, what Agent Bear. And he was their man. He killed people all over the place. Did whatever they said. And then when they got caught, they tried to burn him and tried to feed him to the Muslims. And then when they released him, they tried to charge him again. And then now they've had to admit that no, he was really following orders. Exactly. So that's that's what's going to happen to these young kids that they're going to be brainwashed and taken into uh, Langley and being trained to do uh, all kinds. And they think that it's patriotic to do that. They think like I did, you know, that I, you know, I would give my life for my government, you know. And uh, was there a moment when you find? I mean, was it an incremental awakening when you were down in Latin America after you'd been in Vietnam and a police detective and all these other things? When you're down in Latin America, was there like a moment when you woke up at three a.m. in a sweat, going, "Oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm I'm involved in evil stuff"? Or when? I mean, or was it incremental? It was in 1987, specifically September of 1987, when they grabbed uh, the two young two young Mexican girls, their father and three Colombians. And when they started torturing them and killing them, I says, you know, this is not what the war on drugs is supposed to be. You know, we're out here killing people, um, innocent people that, you know, some of them are innocent, some are not, but it's still, we, we shouldn't be the judge and the executioners. And that's when I realized, says, you know what, this is not for me. This is not what I signed up to, to do. And uh, I left the agency in 90, 91, 92, when they came after me. Uh, because I was uh, writing reports to Washington about all these atrocities was going on. So it was 87 you started waking up? Yes, 87, and I said, you know what, this is wrong. I started keeping journals. I got over 2,000 pictures I took of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and some photos that you've never posted before are now up on your website. We've got a link to it over at InfoWars.com. Tell folks uh, your website address. My website address is powderburns at... Up, excuse me, powderburns.org. Exactly. And uh, photos coming into the country by the CIA uh, that were taken in Guatemala. As a matter of fact, I had a Guatemalan reporter and then Claudia just called me uh, and emailed me and they're doing a big story on the CIA and the DEA's murders in, in Central America. And so, right now, folks, right now, those photos are up there right now. That's right. They're up there right now and uh, I'll be able to label them who they are. And ironically enough, a few months ago, the families of these people that were murdered are emailing me, asking me, you know, how did my father die? You know, did he, did he suffer a lot? And by label them, uh, we just convinced Shelly to put these up last night. His webmaster put them up uh, this morning. And literally before he came in here on air, I had to drag him away uh, uh, an hour ago from one of my computers where he was talking to his webmaster, uh, emailing him, you know, what uh, what names to put on what. So later this afternoon, uh, the uh, names of the people should be there. I mean, obviously their names are there when you see their passports, but but uh, labels there on who specifically was being killed. Uh, Steve, Steve, uh, where are you calling us from today? Uh, Colorado. Welcome. What's on your mind? Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, I had a question uh, about uh, Ken Bucci. Have you ever heard of him? <coughs> he sounds very familiar, yes. Who, wrote, was, who was he? He wrote a book by the name of Operation Pseudo Miranda. Yes, I've heard of that. Yes, exactly. Okay, I was wondering if you were familiar, if you knew him at all. No, I didn't know him, but I, I, I think I glanced uh, through his book. Okay, does it, well, do you think it, is his book accurate? Speak yes, up. it's very accurate, yes. Do you have any idea? Uh, yes, I think it is. Okay. All right, and also the movie, you mentioned the movie Syriana. Is that an accurate movie? It's, it's based on a, a, live, a real story on, on one of the agents that used to work for the agency. Yeah, okay. Yes. It, it, it's, it's, it's based on the life of a controller. 
a high-level CIA officer who, who was controlling whole teams. And uh, because I've heard him on NPR give interviews, I've actually now uh, read the book that it's based on. And all they did in the movie was change some of the names. But, but they would just barely change them. <laughs> okay. Um, the, also, the Medellin cartel down in Colombia, is that a CIA operation, or is that just them be doing their own thing? Well, it uh, started out doing their own thing, but now they're part of the CIA operations. I mean, we, right now we've got DEA guys that are under investigation for smuggling uh, cocaine with the paramilitary. It's the big story right now in Colombia. And I just did a radio interview with uh, Caracol. And um, they're implicating a lot of the DE agents involving drug trafficking with the cartels up there. Okay, and last question. Can you comment on if there is any connection uh, with Henry Kissinger? Not, not at this point. Okay. Not, not myself. All right, well, thank you very much. Yes, sir. I appreciate uh, your call, Steve. Good question. So let's talk to Paul in Florida. Paul, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, hon. I was wanting to know, who can we contact so we can put a stop to this? Well, the government knows it's going on. I mean, the Solicitor General got up there, what was it, 1998, or was it 97, and, and said, yeah, the government brings in the drugs, and it's at the highest level. Uh, I mean, we're doing it right now. We're Number one, we need to end the drug war, because let me just boil this down, and then you can get uh, Selly's take on it if, and, 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 and see, if he agree, uh, uh, see if he agrees. Let me just try to boil this down for you. This is how the scam works, Okay. You've got a whole bunch of cartels and narcotics being produced all over the world. You've got the globalists in control of Afghanistan when they take control in 2001. Now it more than quadruples in its production. And it's publicly admitted that our government's uh, cultivating it and shipping it out. Uh, it's the same thing out of Southeast Asia and Vietnam. It's the same thing everywhere. It's these private families. It's like Skull and Bones was openly founded by the Russell Trust, which was the British East India branch in the U.S. for all legal laudanum or opium, which is then also used for heroin in America. It was actually these big drug families who went and lobbied to make these drugs illegal in the 20s and 30s because they were losing their monopoly. Other people were importing the drugs legally, so they went lobbied to make it illegal, they controlled the cops, they then would sick them on their competition, and then their legal laudanum goes from a dollar a bottle to a hundred dollars a bottle, and that was a hundred dollars a bottle back in the 20s, folks. So so by making their own product illegal and then controlling the black market, they jacked the price up just astronomically. Then cocaine starts getting more popular. Of course, it was in Coca-Cola back at that same time. Then Coke starts getting shipped in and getting popular, so they make it illegal to then go after their competition again, and then when you're your kid gets caught using it, they give a mandatory sentencing of 10 years, they put your child in a private prison that could openly be linked to the very big banks that are actually running the drugs and controlling the cartels, so now your child works as a slave there in the very facility that's owned by the drug dealing family. Okay, and then they also use the drug war to go after any of their competition that tries to ship it in without uh, uh, paying them their cut and uh, being certified. So that's really how it works. If we end the drug war and decriminalize, and they've done this in areas of Europe, about half the population that's using drugs stops using it, the price falls through the floor, crime plummets. Listen, would you rather a heroin head have to break in five houses a day to feed their habit or be able to go get it for free? Uh, from the local government and then not break in your home to steal everything you've got and then oops your 10 year old's there uh, when you're not and so the heroin head you know kills your daughter uh, again the drug <coughs> war uh, drives crime and, and, and the national statistics are out 12 years ago uh, we had uh, a certain level of heroin and cocaine. Twelve years later, it's it's tripled. The heroin has, the cocaine has doubled. We've gone from one million in the prison system to over seven million in the system. And it's a, it's a success. The drug war is designed to take over the entire society. And I appreciate your call, Paula. Shelly's going to ride shotgun with us with our guest that's coming up uh, in the next hour from England. Right now, let's hurry back to your phone calls. Uh, let's go ahead and speak with Elias in Michigan. You're on the air with Sully Costello. Go ahead. Thank you, Alex. And hello, Sully. Sully. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. Sure. I've been a critical observer of the political scene since 1950, when I was 18, and uh, I, especially with Central and South America. <coughs> Are you willing to name the names of the murders, for instance, of, say, Bishop Romero and others, the actual names, personal names of these people that did this thing so they can be brought to justice. He know, well, I mean, 
he knows who the commanders of those death squads were. Sally, go ahead. Yeah, okay, he's going to answer it for you. Yeah, it's, uh, it was uh, El Mayor um, Roberto Davison, who actually, uh, and uh, Dr. Regalado. Uh, Dr. Regalado was the actual shooter of uh, our Bishop Romero. And, um, you know, do you, do you I, have that in your book? Uh, I don't remember if I did or not uh, put it in there, but... Uh, Listen, it's a hardcore book. It names hundreds of names. Yes, it does. Hundreds of them, yes. Yes, yeah, so uh, there, there are names in there of the people who actually committed the murders. And, you know, of course, they try to blame uh, a, a sergeant uh, in, in one of the units uh, who they took care of uh, after everything quieted down. You think they'll ever bring them to justice? Absolutely not, because they don't have witnesses, and you know, if there are witnesses, they're all going to end up dead. Yes, but you're a witness. Absolutely. So, but they, they see with the government how they work is they say, okay, go ahead, let Sally Castillo talk all he wants. You know, within a month or two, people are going to forget about him, and that's basically true. People I'll tend to forget. I'll never forget. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, Elias. I'm going to let you go now. Got to ask your question. Thank you for the call. Jeff in Denver, you're on the air. Welcome. Go ahead, Jeff. Hello, guys. I just wanted to point out a couple of things. And, uh, first of all, I've got powderburns.org linked to the Watchdog Group on my website. But uh, I want to make a couple important points, and I think this is important for all the listeners. And uh, a lot of what Mr. Casello is saying is true, and it's also most of what he's saying is also confirmed through John Kerry's uh, Senate report, the Contra report that he did during this time, and I think that's important uh, for everybody to know that uh, a, lot of, a lot of the things that he was saying has been confirmed in John Kerry's Senate report back in that time, and of course the CIA um, are the largest drug runners in the world, and uh, I wanted to point out, he mentioned something about Laredo, and of course I think another important point would be Juarez, Mexico, which is right below El Paso. Juarez is one of the largest cities uh, of the, uh, in Mexico as far as the border town goes, and I think that that's uh, uh, comparable to the information that he provided on Laredo. Well, I want people to realize the numbers. 800 dead on the U.S.-Mexico uh, side, both sides, just in the Texas region last year alone. It's 840-something. Fifteen of them were cops on our side. And notice how they keep that real quiet. Well, you know, one of but one of the things that people don't realize is that a lot of these people are getting killed. A lot of them, the majority of them, are informants for the FBI and the DEA. Exactly. And and a lot of them, um, you know, the DEA and McAllen will not uh, acknowledge the fact that these people are informants, and that's why you find them with with tags on them after they kill them, uh, with the name of Soplon, which means a snitch. And also, Mr. Costello, I wanted to ask you: there was reports that Barry Seal. Uh, was found when he was found dead, very sealed, that he had George Bush's phone number in his pocket. Do you know anything about that? Yes, he was working directly with uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, at the time, and uh, with Terry Reid and so forth. Yeah, so he and, and also, uh, you know, like you said, Oliver North, Van Lancaster, Buddy Young, William Barr. Yeah, we're out of time. I appreciate your call, Jeff. We'll talk to Will and Dr. Deagle and others in the next segment. Then we've got our guest coming on. Stay with us. Well, Philip Sands is joining us in about eight minutes. And Sally Castillo, former high-level DEA <coughs> agent, will be riding shotgun with us. We'll be getting into uh, more government-sponsored terrorism. This time they wanted to try to goad Saddam into pulling something on the eve of the war to try to get public support, but they were unsuccessful. Big news from England uh, on the fake WMD claims and all of it with our guests coming up in a few minutes. Uh, we're talking to Sally Castillo, author of Powder Burns. Cocaine Conference and the Drug War, and we are about to go to Jeff. Uh, we already talked to Jeff, to Will and Dr. Deagle and others. But Sully, we've already talked about so much, but, but this story is so big, though, there's a lot we haven't covered. Any other key points about your book or about the government drug dealing uh, that you witnessed that the listeners should uh, be aware of? Well, um, no, basically it's, it's really all I got, but uh, there are other books and there are other people coming out now that... Uh, implicating the government in, in drug trafficking. And, uh, yeah, how many agents, I mean, ballpark, because I've seen, uh, it's going to be 30 or 40 I've seen in places like uh, GQ uh, would have five or six different ones in it saying they saw the drugs coming off planes in Miami or drugs in Texas. I mean, how many agents in FBI, CIA, DEA, sheriff departments have gone public about government-sponsored uh, drug dealing? Well, there's several, like Michael Levine and, and other people, but... Uh, <coughs> Basically, what's going on is the fact that the, I started telling people uh, 
while I was an agent, and I wasn't scared of losing my job. And uh, most of these people that are now have uh, their own promoters and everything, um, uh, you know, waited until they retired. What about people who were on the fence? Uh, I mean, do they say to you, yeah, Shelly, you know, you're brave. I wish I could do what you've done, but I just can't do it. I'm afraid. Or what do they say to you? Well, they say they have a mortgage to pay. They got kids. They got to send to college and so forth. So I got a mortgage to pay. It doesn't matter if our government's gutting little kids to blame it on, on their enemies. It doesn't matter if our government's bringing in smack uh, so people can overdose. I just got to go along with it. Exactly. And, you know, it was so sad because uh, all these people that joined to work for the DEA uh, and kept quiet about it, um, not only did they became rich and, and uh, you know, they uh, they were in it for the money. And, um, and, you know, people ask, well, why did you do it? I said, well, you know what? I was looking for a job when I found that one. And I'm not about to stand here and see these, these atrocities happen. Uh, could happen to my grandkids and my kids, you know, and, and I'm not going to let it happen. Well, I commend you for that. Let's uh, go ahead and go to Will in Virginia. You're on the air with Southern Costello. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, sir. sir. Uh, I'm from Tidewater, Virginia. I live out in the country, close to the city. We've got a situation developing there that reminds me a whole lot of Mena, Arkansas. They're building an airfield, very expensive looking one, for these Venus Air Strip. Uh, I'd be interested in investigating this if you think it's within the realm of possibility that someone. Well, I mean, they use they use national security to cover the drug dealing. They always have, but just because there's some weird airport going in doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be bringing in narcotics there. Just because of where Virginia is, I mean, most of it comes into Houston, comes into L.A., comes into. Uh, Sally, do you agree with that statement, or is there a lot of smack coming in on the East Coast? Uh, they're coming in everywhere. I remember when uh, China White was coming into San Francisco, uh, the, uh, our government would not admit it that uh, there was a, a China white epidemic in, in San Francisco and I was one of the very few agents that was uh, able to buy uh, uh, China white from, from the Chinese down in San Francisco to prove that uh, it's been there all along going back to the French connection. So, you know, they tend to cover things up. And, and, and you talk about Mossad. Uh, uh, aren't uh, French intelligence some of the worst about drug dealing? Absolutely. You know, you, you, the history will show you. I mean, that's what it was in the yeah, French connection, the French real connection. story, government, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, that's, it's always been there. Uh, Shelly Costello, it, it, I tell you, two and a half hours blasted past with you. It sure did, and it was fun, and it was great to be here. Well, I tell you, I'm going to have some event in the future here in Austin with some really key people coming into town, and I hope you'll be part of it. I sure hope so. Uh, did uh, you like coming into Austin today to visit with us? Oh, yes, it was great. Well, great. well uh, thank you for coming into the new studio uh, with us, and I really consider you a friend of the show and want to commend you, my brother, for all you've done. Thank you so much. You bet. Uh, to everybody out there, uh, via Candios, get out there and take on the new world order, stand up against these bullies, and support whistleblowers like Sully Costello.